Frontiersman, warrior, white wolf, condemned, scout, general, savior, hero. By any name, Simon Kenton was the Frontier's equivalent of a modern-day superhero. He was bigger and stronger than any other man, and he made it his business to open up to the settlers the Kentucky and Ohio lands. Places he felt were the most beautiful on the face of the earth. He pledged to protect them from the dangers of life on the frontier and upheld that pledge his entire life. His legacy is present all over Kentucky and Ohio. We're here at the Champaign County Historical Society Museum in Urbana, Ohio. I'm from Urbana. My name's Clancy Brown. And I grew up with stories of this man. He was one of the first frontiersmen here in the Ohio country and in Kentucky, a uh, contemporary of Daniel Boone. As a matter of fact, he was here before Daniel Boone. I was a little surprised to learn that outside of this immediate area, not many people know that much about him. But we're going to remedy that. Because together we're going to discover the history and the legend of Simon Kenton. Simon Kenton was a legendary figure on the Kentucky and Ohio frontier, but he was a human being just like everyone else. Simon Kenton was born and lived in Virginia until he was about 16 years old. While living there, Simon wasn't much for doing chores around the farm. He preferred roaming the forest, hunting game, being on his own. That is, until he met and fell in love with Ellen Cummings. Unfortunately for Simon, she became engaged to and then finally married William Leachman. Frustrated, Simon called Leachman out but the older and stronger Leachman beat Simon badly. Simon retreated back to his family farm, continued to roam the hills, chopping wood and working hard. His body started to fill out, and by the age of 16, he was well over six feet tall and superbly muscled. He was born, really, in Virginia, and uh, he lived on, his family lived on what was called the Carter Grant, and uh, they were tobacco farmers, and uh, not very wealthy. What and brought him to... What brought him to the frontier? Um, he had a love affair, or he, he had the love affair, I do believe, with a lady by the name of Ellen Cummings, but uh, she happened to be in love with a man by the name of Willie Leachman, uh -huh. and uh, she married him. Oof. And uh, but they had a terrible fight. Who did? Uh, Simon and Leachman, mm -hmm. and Simon thought he had killed the guy. Oh he had beat Simon up before, but Simon, they entangled again. Simon thought he had killed the man, so he took off before he found out that Leachman had survived. So he actually it was, thought he had murdered a man and was, it was, was yeah, a Exactly, fugitive. and so he became the fugitive to get away instead of being tried for murder. About how old was he? He was 15 years old, okay. almost 16, and he was on his own from that time on. A fugitive, Simon Kenton headed for the frontier and his destiny. Kenton had no money, no gun. He had nothing but the bloodstained clothing on his back. He was on his own at 16. As Kenton headed toward the frontier, or the middle ground as he called it, he passed many settlers and homesteads. Now in order to eat and survive, Kenton hired on for odd jobs as he passed through and depended on the kindness of strangers. He would always 
ask after the name of the next settler on his route. And after being told the name, for example, Brown, he would show up at that settler's door and introduce himself as Simon Brown. Mr. Brown would then wonder at the chances of finding another Brown in this area and would invite Simon in, feed him, and allow him to stay for the night. Simon made his way toward the frontier in this manner, always making sure to do his fair share of work around the homestead before making his way west. At his last stop, Jacob Butler's homestead, Kenton ended up working for quite a while, forming a strong friendship with this man. In fact, throughout most of his time on the frontier, Kenton used the name Simon Butler, borrowed from his good friend. Still see many references to this, but he went by the name of Simon Butler by a guy that had befriended him. What was, what was that story? Uh, well, after he had run away, he would go to this house and he finally someone fed him and then he would find a little information out and then he would go to the next person's house and introduce them as a long lost relative of so and so's. So it progressed and the last one happened to be Butler. I see. Jacob, Jacob Butler. Jacob Butler. Right. And that's how he progressed with that name of Butler until he could come back to Simon Kenton. Now, Jacob's significant also because then he named his rifle. He named his first rifle. Mr. Butler gave it to him. Ah, there you go. And therefore, he named the rifle Jacob in honor of Mr. Butler. I see. So the Shawnees originally knew him as Simon Butler. Simon Butler. And what did they call him? They called him Bodler because they could not pronounce it any other way. And did they call him Bodler even after he had revealed himself to be the... They did many years later, but he was really known to the Shawnees as Katahotha. Oh, after the... After, after the, uh, he was captain. adopted and then he was released. But he was known as Bodler for years. Um, he had asked, he had lied a whole lot, you know, as he come into the country and had actually taken several uh, false names and he'd become very famous as Simon Butler, a name that he had stolen from a, a wealthy miller that, that he had met. And Simon's objective as he went west was to find the cane lands. He had heard stories from his Uncle Tom and others about cane fields stretching as far as the eye can see. What they were calling cane is what we know as bamboo, and at one time Kentucky was covered with it. This is one of the only extant examples of cane in Kentucky. Simon Kenton made several early trips to find these cane lands, but he didn't have any luck. In a document that was dated 18 and 30, it is said that Simon Kenton was a giant of a man. Uh, we really have no way of knowing exactly how large a man that Kenton was, but uh, with the average person weighing 150 or 60 pounds and probably 5 foot 10, we can guess that Kenton probably weighed oh, 200 pounds and was in excess of six feet, six foot two or three maybe. Uh, it's obvious from some of the things that happened in Kenton's life that uh, his physical strength was, was enormous. Uh, he lost his first rifle when he was ambushed by the Indians, him and, and the Long Dutchman, they called him, and another gentleman by the name of George Strader. Strader had been, they'd been out uh, uh, running their trap lines and as they were soaking wet. It was in November and they'd come in and they'd stripped off all of their clothes and the Dutchman had made camp and he was uh, cooking their supper and they'd taken their clothes off so that they could dry and the next thing they knew they were under, under siege by the Indians and all they had time to do was uh, to holler back at one another, meet at the bear trap. Uh, six days later, stark naked and starved to death, they ended up on the banks of the Ohio River and were saved by the Great House Party. Only a man of the greatest of physical strength and mental strength as well could have ever endured such a trial as this. And one of the wonderful things that we like about Simon Kenton, not only is the hero of the frontiers people, but he was one of the very first people that came over the mountains into the dark and bloody ground of Kentucky. He was one of the first people that came into the old Northwest Territory. Uh, there is probably not a man, woman, or child in the state of Kentucky from the Kentucky River to the Ohio River that doesn't owe their life to Simon Kenton. Simon Kenton decided he was going to find the Cane Lands. Now, the Cane Lands, he had heard, is an amazingly beautiful place, full of incredible amounts of wildlife. And after several abortive attempts, he finally found it in Cane Tucky. He found it right here at Blue Licks. He also found a salt lick. In fact, the old Buffalo Trail ran right through Blue Lick, the Buffalo Trail that we're on now. Now, these buffalo in Kenton's time could go on for miles and miles and miles. And the herds would cut swaths through the forest as wide as four-lane highways. 
Even though Simon had found one of the most fertile places in America, he soon remembered he didn't enjoy farming. He wanted to be roaming the woods, and he soon headed back to the frontier. It was spring of 1775 before Simon Kenton finally found the cane lands of Kentucky that he'd heard so much about. Uh, he came into Kentucky this time with a gentleman by the name of Thomas Williams, and they quickly cleared a, an acre of corn with inside of what is now Old Washington. Uh, there's a good document that says that it didn't take Kenton long to remember that he wasn't cut out to be a farmer and that if he, if he wasn't exploring the rivers in a canoe or out roaming the woods, that he just didn't stay satisfied for, for too awful long. Simon Kenton's America was not like this country is today, obviously. For one, it was a much smaller world. The land was vast and in most places, very sparsely populated. And everyone knew or had heard of everyone else. One of the things that gets lost in discussion of this time and this place and these people is that for all the distance and wilderness uh, that we're talking about here, it was actually a very small community that most people knew each other. Uh, most, most people's paths crossed. We know for a fact that uh, Simon Kenton and Tecumseh met. Tecumseh was a small boy, maybe nine, ten years old. And Tecumseh, even at, at that age, it was clear he was going to be something special. Uh, Simon would spend his evening staked out on the ground spread eagle, and uh, people would pass by and urinate on him, or, or this, he would suffer some indignity um, and torture. Tecumseh, as a small boy, put a stop to that. When he came by Tecumseh's village, he demanded that no one touch the captive and sat with him the entire night to make sure that uh, no indignity was visited on Simon. And later in life, uh, it's well known that Tecumseh reviled any forms of torture uh, at all. Uh, it was one of the things that separated him as a leader of the Shawnees. Uh, we also know that um, that Simon ran into Andrew Jackson in a tavern, uh, who picked a fight with Simon and lost rather quickly. I think one punch was thrown at Simon's. Uh, he ran across George Rogers Clark, uh, George Washington, when he was out uh, doing his survey of the Western Frontier, uh, uh, crossed paths with Simon. Uh, we already know that he was, uh, Simon was a good friend of Daniel Boone's, and anybody Boone was associated with certainly knew Simon and had met him. So it's a pretty good bet that anybody of note that had made, its w made their way to the western frontier had at one point or another some contact with Simon Kenton. In my opinion, Simon Kenton is probably the most important pioneer character to the state of Kentucky. Um, he was in the state of Kentucky at least as early as 1771 or 72 and really didn't realize that he was here. It was uh, spring of 1775 before he really found what he was looking for. He had, um, he had thought that he'd killed a gentleman uh, over a girl, a lady by the name of Ellen Cummings, and uh, he'd run into a couple of characters and they'd come, come inland and they didn't find what they was looking for. And he... Simon's hunting and wilderness skills served him well when he arrived on the frontier. He so enjoyed being in the wilderness and was so good at it that settlers began to turn to him for advice and for protection. Perhaps to atone for the death of Leachman, Simon immediately set about helping anyone and everyone he could. He became the self-appointed greeter of flatboats or keel boats coming down the Ohio River, and he would do everything he could to protect the settlers, from hunting for the settlements like Boonesboro and Harrodsburg to fighting off attacking Indians. He'd run into a couple of characters and they'd come, come inland and they didn't find what they was looking for and he thought he was lost and went back and actually settled on the Great Canal for about uh, oh, three or four years. But in 1775, he found the cane lands that he'd been told about and found all of the game. And from that point on, he actually become a welcomer in chief to the state of Kentucky. And his greatest uh, pleasure uh, was to bring people into the state and, and help them to go to where that they had heard about or towns that they had heard about and try to teach them enough to save their hair to keep from getting killed by the Indians. And uh, unlike Boone, he didn't have a John Filson as a press agent, and he was a very 
a very humble man, and uh, he wasn't a braggart of, of any any sorts. And he did get saved later on in life. And it's there's a good document that that states that that probably the only thing that he that changed it all is he laid up the rifle gun for the first time since a, a gentleman by the name of Jacob Butler had given him his first one at 16 years of age. Simon's strongest relationship was with Simon Gertie, a small but tough man whom Simon saved from a beating at the hands of soldiers in one of the frontier forts. The two became fast friends and then blood brothers. The sight of the two of them together, one tall and muscular and the other small and thin, must have been almost comical. Together they hunted for the settlements and argued about the white man's place on the frontier. They shared a kinship that remained despite Gertie's adoption of the Indian lifestyle and his eventual siding with the British. Colonists labeled Gertie a traitor, and he became known as the White Indian. He was one of the most hated men on the frontier. Simon Kenton, however, cherished their friendship his entire life and stood up for Gertie when others wouldn't. When Gertie proclaimed that he was leaving to join the Indians, Simon supported his decision, and together they vowed to protect each other forever, no matter what. While in the wilderness together, Gertie would watch while Simon made tomahawk improvements, a primitive way of claiming land in the early days of the frontier. It was on one of these hunting and tomahawk improvement adventures that Simon and Gertie pledged to be blood brothers forever, and that was a vow that Kenton lived by his entire life. Simon Kenton was developing quite a name for himself. The settlers called him their savior, and he was fast developing into the Indians' greatest enemy. Now, Simon was not an Indian hater, and he never attacked the Indians without provocation. He did, however, protect the settlers, and this meant that he often had run-ins with the native Shawnees and other tribes. After several raids uh, between both sides in which prisoners were taken and horses were taken, the settlers destroyed the Mackachee towns of the Shawnees. At this point, Simon decided to enter into negotiations for a prisoner exchange. One of the people he, ex he negotiated with was the Shawnee chief man who walks with stick. And we have here the great, great, great grandson of man who walks with stick, who was also known as Captain John Perry. Now, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that negotiation. Well, it's, it started that the, the people started trying to uh, do the negotiation across the river, mm. which is quite large, quite wide, and there was a lot of yelling going on. And uh, they did come to somewhat of an agreement, but there's one gentleman on the Kentucky side wanted specifically two of his horses back. He prized very highly. So uh, it came down that uh, Simon Kenton and another gentleman swam this river to negotiate face to face with uh, Captain John and Shawnee. And in doing so, they uh, come to an agreement that they would exchange the horses and the prisoners. And in turn, the Shawnee got back uh, their prisoners, which had been taken, including Captain John's wife. Mm. This is Simon Kenton's gun on display at the Greene County Historical Society in Xenia, Ohio. It's not Jacob. We don't know what happened to Jacob, but it is an authentic Kentucky long rifle. One of Simon's nicknames was Man Whose Gun Is Never Empty. The Shawnee called him that. And the reason they gave him that was because he was one of the few frontiersmen that could reload on the run. Now, that's significant because this is a one-shot weapon. And if you didn't kill just what you were aiming at the first time, chances are if it was something to eat, you'd have to chase after it. And if it was something that's trying to kill you, you'd have to run away from it. So the quicker you get your gun loaded and turn around and fire again, the better your chances of having dinner that night or surviving to fight another day. That's remarkably light, but even so, I just can't figure out the logistics of powdering it and priming it and putting a bullet in it and turn it around and shooting all running as fast as I can. Quite a skill. The Indians knew him as Simon Butler, but they called him Bodler. Boonesboro, named after Daniel Boone, of course, was one of the most important settlements in Kentucky. Simon used it as a base of operations from time to time and was chief scout and hunter. 
In Kentucky in the late 18th century, there were three main forts, Harrodsburg, Logan Station, and Boonesboro. Now, none of these forts were very big affairs. In fact, most of the settlers lived outside the forts. Only when imminent Indian attack was threatened would people come inside. And often, that would tax the already limited resources of the fort beyond its capacity. Kenton was in charge of protecting the fort and hunting for all the inhabitants. He was known throughout the frontier for his wilderness skills, and people had come to depend on him for safety, support, and for their very lives. And this included Daniel Boone. In 1776, Boonesboro was under siege. The Indians had cut off supplies from the settlers. Now Simon and Daniel determined that a party should go outside and try to gather some food and firewood. Boone first sent out two men, but as soon as they were far enough away from the fort, they were cut down by Indian fire. One man was killed, but the second was only injured. A couple of Indian warriors then emerged from the tree line in order to scalp the two men. Boone, with some others, broke from the safety of the fort in order to save their comrades from this atrocity. But as soon as they had gotten away from the walls far enough, another group of Indians emerged from the trees and cut them off from the fort. It had been a trick. Boone was hit in the ankle by a bullet almost immediately and collapsed to the ground. The Indians were closing in. Kenton, seeing the danger that Boone and his party were in, immediately left the safety of the fort and attacked. He shot an Indian that had been threatening Boone and then ran forward, reloading on the run. Boone pleaded with him to leave him alone and save himself, but Kenton would have none of it. Instead, he picked Boone up in his arms like a child and took off running for the gates of Boonesboro. In his way stood two Indian warriors, their tomahawks raised for battle. Simon, carrying Boone, couldn't bring his rifle or his knife or his tomahawk to bear, so he threw Boone at the two Indians, knocking them both down and one of them completely out. He buried his tomahawk in the skull of the second and then picked Boone back up, who had also been knocked out, and ran into the fort. When the siege of Boonesboro was over, Kenton's legend grew even larger. After saving Boone's life, Kenton continued to be the savior of the frontier. He hunted and protected for the settlers throughout the Kentucky Territory, including Fort Harrodsburg and other stations. When horses were stolen from Boonesboro one day in September of 1778, Simon and his friend Alex Montgomery, along with a relative tenderfoot named George Clark, went out to get the horses back. With Simon's wilderness skills, it was really no challenge to track and find the horses, and they stole them back under the cover of darkness. It was when they got back to the Ohio River that things got interesting. Here along the banks of the Eagle Creek, a minor tributary to the Ohio River, Simon Kenton began the most horrifying and brutal adventure of his life, for it was here he was taken prisoner by the Shawnee. Simon and Montgomery arrived at the Ohio River. Clark had already disappeared into the woods somewhere. But they found that it was too rough to safely ford with the horses. Now, while Montgomery looked for a better place to cross, Simon went back to make sure that they weren't being followed. He went up on the ridge, and as soon as he did, he saw a party of Indian warriors led by Bona. Immediately, Simon took aim with his rifle, and pulled the trigger. Unfortunately, the shot was a flash in the pan, and Bona and his men saw Simon immediately. Simon took off running. The warriors gave chase, and even though Simon was faster and bigger than any man on the frontier, the five warriors were able to catch him because they were on horseback. Luckily, Bona and his warriors didn't recognize Simon as Bodler, their great enemy, and thought he was just another ordinary horse thief. They began to torture Simon. During the torture, Simon saw Montgomery up on the ridge and immediately turned the other direction and yelled for him to save himself, to get away as quickly as he could. Unfortunately, Montgomery didn't listen and fired on the group of warriors. His shot missed Bona by a hair. The warriors quickly chased him down and killed and scalped him. They came back to where Simon was being held and slapped him across the face with Montgomery's bloody scalp, calling him a horse thief. When the warriors tired of the torture, they staked Simon out on the ground for the night, naked and exposed to the cold night air, 
and the bugs of the wilderness. The next morning, Bona's group was joined by another war party. One of them recognized Simon for who he was, and Bona realized that he had captured the Shawnee's greatest enemy, Bodler. Simon had to run several gauntlets once he was discovered. Usually, when a captive was taken by the Shawnees, they would go to the first village or the village of the captor, and they would set up the gauntlet. Now, the gauntlet was two rows of people all armed with sticks and bushes and brambles uh, that ended at the council house. The captive would start at one end and then run the length of the gauntlet into the council house. If he made it, if he made it standing up, if he survived, if he didn't pass out, and he made it into the council house, then no one could touch him until they decided what to do with him. And they would either adopt him, uh, make him a slave, sell him to the British, and often, well, not often, but sometimes condemn him to death. They tied Simon naked to the bare back of a wild horse and slapped its rump, forcing the horse to run through the branches and thorns, cutting Simon's skin to pieces. But what they were doing now was nothing compared to what awaited Simon at the Shawnee villages they would visit. Now, Simon was no ordinary prisoner. As soon as it was discovered who he was, Bona swelled with pride and knew that he had to take him to Chalagotha to run the gauntlet and have his fate decided. It was unheard of for any man to run more than one gauntlet, but Simon was no ordinary man. He went from town to town, given time to recuperate between each gauntlet. Each gauntlet was brutal and bloody and took a toll on Simon's body and mind. Along the way, though, he wanted to show him off, so he took him to every village along the way. And at every village, Simon had to run a gauntlet. Now, this is exceptional because no captive ever had to run more than one gauntlet. It was brutal. But Simon, by some accounts, ran as many as nine or ten. We know stories from at least three. Uh, it was a good bet that he ran between four and six gauntlets. In his first gauntlet, the villagers lined up. Women and children first, warriors second. Bona gave him the signal to begin the gauntlet after he was stripped naked. And the signal was a particularly brutal blow across the back, one so strong that it, that it knocked him to the ground. And the women and children started to beat him. But once Simon got up and started running, the women and children couldn't do very much damage. They had never seen someone like this before, someone as athletic and strong and swift as Simon. Uh, unfortunately, the warriors were at the end of the gauntlet, and they could see, they could prepare for his arrival. When he got to the warrior part of it, he was practically beaten senseless. He almost made it to the lodge, but then was tripped, uh, hit with a particularly brutal blow across his, the back of his legs. He was tripped. The entire village descended upon him and beat him. At some point, the beating stopped. He was picked up, taken back to the head of the gauntlet. The gauntlet was reformed, and he had to run it again. In another gauntlet, Simon decided that he was going to take his chances, and he was going to escape this time. So he scoped it out before he ran it, and he saw some fat old squaw at one end with no teeth, perhaps, uh, getting ready to smack him with the, some bramble bush. And Simon took off and ran straight at this woman. And when, <laughs> when he got to her, he laid right into her, jumped right in her chest, knocked her over, and started taking off for the hills. He might have made it, too. He might have made it to the, to the forest, and, and there stood a, a, a good chance of escape. Not a great one, but a good one. Unfortunately, Blue Jacket one of the Shawnee's war chief, was coming to that village to see Bodler, to see the great enemy of the Shawnees. Uh, he was a little late for the gauntlet, 
but he was just in time to run into Simon. Uh, Blue Jack was on horseback, uh, saw this enormous naked man running for the woods. Blue Jacket ran him down, took out his tomahawk, and struck Simon on the head with the pipe end, which punched a hole through Simon's skull. Simon fell unconscious and didn't regain consciousness for some days afterwards. This beautiful valley is the site of the Makicheek towns, one of the largest populations of Shawnee in the world. It was also one of the largest non-European populations on the North American continent at the time, until its destruction in 1786. This is the path up to Maluntha's town, above the Makicheek towns, where Simon was brought to run yet another gauntlet and to be judged by the elders of the Shawnee. Simon was being paraded around the towns and villages of the Shawnee nation. Kenton was a real celebrity to the Indians, their greatest enemy, the giant who had battled them throughout the years, and it was quite a coup for them to have captured him. They didn't want to waste an opportunity to show him off, and Simon's gauntlet journey was designed to allow all the Shawnee people to share in this great triumph and join in the great celebration of the capture and eventual execution of Simon Kenton. This is Squaw Rock, the site of Melantha's town. It was at Melantha's town that Simon was brought to run a gauntlet and where he was ultimately judged and condemned to die by burning at the stake. Between each gauntlet, Bona, his captor, made sure that his body was allowed to heal. He was attended to by Indian women and nursed back to health, all to run another gauntlet. Bona, who had stayed with Simon through all the gauntlets, was making his way towards Wapatomica, the seat of the final judgment of the Shawnee Nation, where Simon would run his last gauntlet and then be executed. This is the site of Wapatomica, Chief Black Hoof's town. Black Hoof was the principal chief of the Shawnee. This is also where they brought Simon to begin the condemnation and execution rituals. And yes, the ritual included running another gauntlet. When Simon finally arrived at Chalagotha, he was in pretty rough shape. Remember, he had already been through between three and five uh, gauntlets already. So he was, he was hurting. And it was decided to allow him to convalesce, to take a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, and convalesce uh, and get strong for this last gauntlet. It was probably an excuse also for the Shawnee to gather more people to, to Chalagotha to, to witness this event. Uh, but you have to think as Simon is lying there getting better uh, just to be tortured again, that he was beginning to lose hope. I think he knew by this time that, that his chance of adoption was pretty slim. About a year before, Daniel Boone had been adopted and accepted into the tribe, accepted as a brother Shawnee, and then betrayed him, be, betrayed the Shawnee, and gone back to Boonesboro. Add to that the fact that Simon's reputation was at least as big as Boone's. His physical stature was remarkable. He was a giant. And he probably became more emblematic of the white incursion into the Shawnee land than anyone else. So there was a lot of hatred built up that he was the focus point of. Um, on the morning that he woke up, realizing this, you have to wonder what was going through his mind. He knew he probably wouldn't survive the gauntlet, and he knew that if he did, that he would be burned at the stake. The Shawnee execution ritual, the burning of the stake, was not what you might think it is. It was a uh, very different than the pictures of the, that we get from Britain, of the European version. What they would do was they would tie you to a stake, a cord about six feet long, seven feet long, tied to your ankle or your wrist. Then they would build a fire, or they would build 
a fire around you in a ring. Stack it up with fuel. And so you didn't so much as burn as you did roast. And before they even lit the fire, the subject was tortured and beaten and stabbed, depending on how poorly he was regarded by the Shawnees at the time. We know this because of an account of the burning of Colonel William Crawford in the Upper Sandusky, who they didn't like very much at all. But I think it's a safe bet to say that at least Simon was respected enough to escape most of this torture. Couldn't have hurt him much anyway after what he'd been through. Now, the interesting thing about Simon's execution was that prior to it, he had been adopted and given the name White Wolf. You can speculate on why they adopted him. I like to think it was because he was such an example to them that they couldn't let him die with dignity and still be a white man, so they might as well adopt him and condemn him as a Shawnee. After you're condemned, you're painted black. And as soon as you are painted black, you are called katahota, which means the condemned. And as far as the Shawnee were concerned, you were a walking dead man. From that time on, Simon was known as Katahota. This is the execution site of the Shawnee, the end game for Simon. There's a dance circle still here where the uh, Shawnee continue to conduct rituals. Now, by this time, Simon was not without his advocates within the Shawnee nation, and in fact, uh, he had been adopted and given the name White Wolf and then subsequently condemned as a Shawnee. So his adoption didn't help him that much. There's lots of stories about what happened the day that he was to be executed. My particular favorite is that he was tied to the stake. The circle of fuel was lit. And gathering force. And then the heavens opened up and rain poured down and extinguished the fire. Now, to Simon's advocates, of course, this was irrefutable evidence that the Great Spirit did not intend for this great white warrior to die in this manner. Black Hoof, however, was unconvinced and declared that Simon would be executed the next day. Well, by this time, word of Simon's capture had reached the British in Detroit through another frontiersman named Simon Gertie. Gertie and Kenton had been blood brothers since before the war. Gertie went to the British and Kenton stayed on the American side. And Gertie had convinced the British that Simon would be invaluable to their war effort and convinced them to, to buy him from the Shawnee. On the next day, the second attempt at execution, Simon was tied to the stake wood was lit around him, and in rides Simon Gertie. Simon powwowed with uh, Black Hoof, and Black Hoof commanded that the fire be extinguished and that Simon be sold to the British. That day, Simon rode off with Gertie and headed to Detroit eventually, where he subsequently escaped from the British and returned to the Kentucky settlements. Kenton was taken to Fort Detroit, and he teamed up with Simon Gertie again, serving as scouts and hunters for the fort, a familiar role. Kenton was not content to remain a prisoner, however, and it wasn't too long before he began to set his gaze south toward the Ohio and Kentucky country. Simon Gertie knew his friend would not be there long and looked the other way the night that Simon escaped. There are stories of other people inside the fort who, once they knew Simon Kenton helped him to escape, even though he was considered an enemy of the crown, the respect for Simon was great, even among the British. This is the way the land looked when Simon Kenton was here. Unspoiled wilderness, with danger at every corner. 
Even while Simon Kenton was a captive of the Shawnees, he was so struck with the beauty of the land that he vowed to come back and settle and live out his life in the Ohio country. As Simon was making his tour of the Shawnee villages, one night he and his captors stopped at a natural spring. They tied Simon to a tree while his captors uh, drank from the natural spring. Simon took this opportunity to look out over the Mad River Valley, and he swore that if he survived this ordeal, he would come back to settle. He was so struck with the beauty. And indeed, that's what happened. This is the site of Simon's first Ohio homestead. Can you imagine? You're tortured, forced to run gauntlets, tied up to spend the night, and you look out over the countryside and remark how beautiful it is and vow to come back one day and build a house. Simon Kenton was one extraordinary man. The stories of Simon Kenton's adventures go on forever. Every settler had a favorite story about how Simon had saved his life or someone he knew. And legends about Simon followed him wherever he went. In one way or another, every settler on the Ohio and Kentucky frontier owed Simon Kenton a debt of gratitude. He was just always there. He set up a station, uh, what is now Old Washington, just off of the, the uh, Ohio River, right outside of Maysville, Kentucky, on Limestone Creek. And that was kind of a jumping off place uh, as people would come into the state of Kentucky. And um, he was just there for them. He was there to teach them. He was there as support. He was there when, when the families uh, were attacked by the Indians. He was the type of person that would go. and he, he wasn't an Indian hater to the point that he would go and attack the Indians just for the sport of it, like some of the people would, but in, uh, in a retaliatory type method. Uh, he was just very helpful, a very humble man. One morning, when returning to the Ohio River from hunting or tracking, Simon came upon a group of newcomers to the frontier. They were burning a fire that was throwing up a huge column of smoke. Kenton politely told them that, that if they were looking to get massacred, they were going about it the right way. He then showed them how to build a smokeless fire. One of the men, however, looked really familiar to Simon. Later on in life, after he had had all of his, a lot of his adventures, he'd even been into the Ohio country, uh, he was on the three islands where George Rogers Clark had put all the ammunition and everything, and they were coming back into that area on the Hive River, and they, uh, he saw this man that looked remarkably like him. Hmm. It happened to have been his brother. And he asked about if he had ever heard of Simon Kenton that murdered that Willie Leachman, and he goes, oh, no, you're absolutely wrong. He said it was Willie Leachman that murdered Simon Kenton, and they couldn't put him in prison because there was no body. I'll be done. So Simon said, it's me, I'm alive. So at that point, he made up his mind if he would go back and get his family, which eventually he did, he did and brought them back into the Kentucky country. Terrific. So it was actually nine years that he kept this name until he, by happen chance, ran into his brother and found out that he indeed had not killed Willie Leachman and that actually Leachman had been tried for his murder, but acquitted for lack of evidence because they couldn't find Simon Kenton's body. Knowing that it was now safe to return to Virginia, he went there straight away. He walked into his old home, ducking to pass through the doorway now that he was full grown, and he hugged his mother. He once again took the name Simon Kenton, and the legend continued to grow. Simon kept his promise to himself, and returned to the Ohio country to settle near modern-day Urbana, Ohio. He built a house here on a site where he was tied as a captive for the night. He lived the rest of his life in Ohio and even brought his family to Ohio to settle, giving them a great deal of the land that he had claimed by Tomahawk's improvements over the years. This is a barn that Simon Kenton built with his own hands in Sainsfield, Ohio. He even brought out old Willie Leachman himself and gave him some land in Kentucky in which to settle. Simon Kenton was an illiterate man. He could neither read nor write. Uh, his wife Elizabeth in later years taught him to write his name Simon Kenton. Uh, Simon Kenton knew what a disadvantage this was to him and he took it upon himself to send the Indian children and the pioneer children to school himself.
This land is part of Simon Kenton's original holdings, and his son settled on this property. If you watch and listen closely, you can imagine that you are walking in Simon's footsteps as he made his way through the frontier. Simon went on to be one of the most respected citizens of the Ohio frontier, and first achieved the rank of major, then brigadier general. He was often consulted by U.S. leaders on Indian affairs, and the Indians, who had been so unsuccessful in killing him so many times, started to look at him as if he were under some special grace. Despite his torture and the gauntlet runs, Simon remained a friend to the Indians, and many Indians visited him at his home in Urbana. Bona, the warrior who had captured him was a frequent visitor and eventually lived on Kenton land with him, as did Captain Johnny. In my opinion, Simon Kenton is probably the most important pioneer character to the state of Kentucky. Uh, he, a lot of times people will ask the question if Kenton was an Indian hater, and he was probably much more like the Indians than the vast majority of white men by... Um, Oh, by 17 and 90, he'd done got fed up with all of the land speculators coming into the state of Kentucky, and he'd moved across the river into Ohio Territory, Champaign County, and, and uh, in later years become great friends with the Indians. There was uh, even, uh, while he was captured, when him and Alex Montgomery had, had gotten captured back, they'd made him run the gauntlet nine times. And, of course, each time, the I guess the, really the, in the gauntlet, what they try to do is to knock you to the ground, uh, but yet not kill you. And he'd been uh, given a nurse, and the, the Indian's uh, name was Bona, that was given the, the job of nursing him back to health each time so he could run the gauntlet again. And I know in later years, there's a neat document to where Bona would come to Kenton's house and always wanting food or favors. Or, and uh, one time, Kenton, he was a celebrated old man, so he was entertaining guests. And... Uh, Anyway, Bona was very obnoxious, come in and belching and picking his teeth, and Kenton jumped to his feet and said, Bona, why do I put up with you? As, as Bona arrogantly said, because I let you live, Bodler, because I let you live. Late in life, Simon Kenton was regarded as a respected Indian expert. During the War of 1812, Kenton was called to a battlefield to identify the body of Tecumseh, the great Shawnee chief. Kenton took his time examining the bodies of over 300 Indians. When he found Tecumseh, he hesitated, for he knew that Tecumseh's body would be mutilated by the soldiers for souvenirs. Instead, he pointed out another body close by, one that was wearing a lot of jewelry. And as the soldiers went about stealing everything they could, jewelry, clothing, even cutting into the body for souvenirs, Kenton is said to have turned to Tecumseh's body and said, There have been cowards here. As an old man, probably in the last year of Kenton's life, it's, it's written that he made the statement that uh, even though that he knew he was surrounded by nothing but friends and good neighbors, that he couldn't keep but, but uh, to break his groundward glance as he walked with often and quick surveys of all and everything that was about him, that this habit of being constantly alert and constantly in fear for better than 60 years wasn't something to be broken. Simon died in 1836 in Logan County, Ohio. He was later reinterred here in Urbana, Ohio, in Champaign County, the county south of Logan. About 50 years after his death, the state of Ohio erected this monument to him. And to this day, Indians from all over will hold ceremonies here and leave tributes of feathers and copper and sweetgrass and tobacco and sage, all to honor a man who in war was their fiercest enemy, but who in peace became their greatest friend, 
Simon Kenton. Simon Kenton is still assisting travelers across the Ohio River in the form of the Simon Kenton Memorial Bridge. Built in the 1930s, it connects Maysville, Kentucky to Aberdeen, Ohio. Now to the settlers in Kentucky, the Ohio country was wilderness, absolute frontier, completely unexplored and very, very dangerous. It was here that Simon would meet the flatboats coming down the river full of neophyte settlers and conduct them to a station which would serve as a safe haven for their continued travel. Today, the bustling life of southern Ohio goes on unabated. Cars fly by the sites where Simon Kenton risked his life to make the land safe for homesteaders and settlers. Recently, the state of Ohio designated State Route 68, the Simon Kenton Memorial Highway. All that remains are monuments and memories to be found spread all over the land on which Kenton once walked, the land he fought and bled for, believing it to be the most beautiful on the face of the earth. There are paintings and artifacts, possessions and touchstones located in various museums and historical societies in Kentucky and Ohio, a bust here, a signature preserved there, a piece of Simon Kenton's original casket, one of Simon's amazing long rifles. Not much else is left to document the life of this great man. There are schools, Boy Scout troops, bridges, towns, and counties named after Kenton. Old Washington, the station he established near Maysville, Kentucky, has a frontier festival dedicated to him every year. People, some, some of them kin to Kenton, come from all over the country to honor this great man and for a weekend of frontier living, reenactments, food, fellowship, and fun. All these memories and memorials are testament to the legend of Simon Kenton, early America's greatest frontiersman. Kenton died on April 29, 1836, at the remarkable age of 81 years, 26 days. Before he died, Kenton's last words were, I have fought the last battle, and it has been the hardest of them all. His headstone reads, full of honors, full of years. quiet now here. It's been many winters since the wars have passed. My people are out west and up north in Canada. And it's peaceful. The birds are singing. But at night, the spirits roam restlessly, awaiting their return. 